So now, with our introduction into quantum theory, we have a better, or at least a more current understanding of what our model of the atom would look like, and a better understanding, or at least a more accurate representation, of what the electrons might look like when we take a look at those quantum numbers. But surely, with a better understanding of the atom, we have to have a different way of representing it, as opposed to, say, Bohr-Rutherford diagrams or Lewis structures. And, of course, we do and we refer to these representations as electron configurations. So, electron configuration for a particular element will look something like this, and if you have a certain type of periodic table, or maybe you've seen one of these types of periodic tables, they'll actually have an electron configuration like this for each one of the elements. But, if we understand that these electron configurations are a little more accurate than what we've been depicting before, and don't get me wrong, there still is a place for both Lewis structures and Bohr-Rutherford diagrams in our understanding of chemistry and the physical world, there must be some way that we can arrive at these electron configurations. Before we do, let's take a closer look at what this electron configuration represents. The larger numbers in front indicate the energy level in which these particular electrons can be found. Well, the letters represent the sublevel within a particular energy level that these electrons are going to be found. Now, if we take a closer look at these superscript numbers, we can see that these superscript numbers represent the total number of electrons that we have in that particular sublevel for that particular element. But how do we come up with these numbers, letters, and, well, numbers? You see, if we take a look at the periodic table, we could almost separate it into blocks. And in fact, that's what I'm going to do right here. I'm going to separate it into four blocks that I'm going to refer to as the S block, which really sort of encompasses the first two groups. We have the P block, which encompasses sort of the rest of the representative elements. We have the D block, which is all of our transition metals. And then we have the F block, which are these two bottom rows that we generally tend to see apart from the periodic table. If we take a look at another representation of the periodic table, one that looked like this, we can start to get a sense of how we're going to use it to help us assign electrons for our electron configurations. We can see that the period that the elements are in, at least for the representative elements, that is, those elements in the S block and the P block, they correspond to the period number for that particular element. While in the D block, we can see that the uh, energy level that we are supposed to represent actually is one less than the period number that we find. And if we get down to the F block, we can see that, well, since that F block should be in the sixth and seventh period, we're actually representing electrons that are in sublevels that are two below the actual period number. So this is something that we just sort of have to remember as we work our way through these electron configurations. Now we can also note that the maximum number of electrons that we can assign to any particular sublevel is limited by the number of elements, and ultimately the number of electrons, that we have in any one of those blocks. So you can see that the S block can hold a maximum of two electrons, representing the two elements that we see in that S block of the periodic table, and the P block can hold a maximum of six, the D block can hold a maximum of ten, and the F block can hold a maximum of fourteen. Now this actually does correspond to values that are assigned from quantum numbers, but for our purposes here, we're just looking at how we're going to use this periodic table to assign these electron configurations. So if we see the periodic table represented like this, we can start to arrange or use the periodic table in such a way to start these electron configurations. So the first thing we're going to do is we have to figure out how many electrons we're actually going to represent. Now if we take a look at tungsten, we can see that its atomic number is 74. And yes, that indicates that it has 74 protons, but for the neutral element, that also indicates that it has 74 electrons. So regardless of how we're going to represent this element, we have to account for those 74 electrons. And if we take a look at the model of our periodic table, at least this model, we can start to assign electrons and start to come up with the electron configuration for tungsten. We see tungsten exists down here in the sixth period. So ultimately we've got to assign these electrons to all of the elements leading up to tungsten. And we refer to a method that we, were, that we call the Aufbau Principle, which basically states that we fill in sequential order. So we start with hydrogen. Now hydrogen we can see is, exists in the 1s sublevel. 
So we are going to place that single electron for hydrogen in the 1s sublevel, and therefore it's referred to as 1s1. And as we move across to helium, we start to assign a second electron, and we become 1s2. And as we move down, we can see that we fill it up 2s1 and 2s2. And now we start to have an available p sublevel, so we fill that up as well, because we have many electrons to go. And now we have a 2p6. And as we move down to the 3s, we now have 3s2 and 3p6. And now we have 4s2. And now we have to remember that when we get to this block of the periodic table, what we're going to call the d block for the transition elements, we have to drop down one number. That is one number less than the period number. So in this case, being the fourth period, we're now in the 3 d sublevel and we're going to occupy this entire sublevel as well. So this is 3 d 10 and then we move back because we are now in the p block into the 4 p 6 and down into the 5 s 2 and then we're going to occupy again a full d sublevel but again it has to be one less than the period number so now we move into a 4 d 10 we move back into the 5 p 6 and now we're finally moving into the period where we find the element that we're dealing with tungsten and we now see that we kind of have a 6 s 2 where you're going to now drop down into the f because remember the f block actually occupies the 6th and 7th periods respectively. So now we have 14 electrons that we have to account for. So we have a 4F14. And if we've done our math already, we should find that we have done 70 electrons or assigned 70 electrons now. And we just have to place four more in that 5D. And so finally now, we have our entire electron configuration for tungsten. And if we take a look at the end of this, we can see if we add up all of these superscript numbers, we can see that we should get 74 electrons, the atomic number of tungsten, and the number of electrons that we have to assign. So you're probably looking at this electron configuration and saying, I, I thought this was going to be shorter than writing out all those quantum numbers. A and it is, but you might also be looking at it and saying, there's still a lot of numbers to write. And we do have a way called a condensed electron configuration that actually makes it a little bit simpler. You see, what we do is we only account for, like many times in chemistry, the valence electrons. So what we start with is the noble gas and its electron configuration from the previous period. So in the case of tungsten, it's going to be xenon. And you can see now that if we take xenon and put it in square brackets to indicate the electron configuration of xenon, we now start with its configuration and then move into the S before we move into the F before we move back into the D. And you can see that this condensed electron configuration takes up a lot less space, but still communicates the same information. You see the electrons for xenon and the electrons that we have in our valence level still should add up to those 74 electrons. Now I should note that there are many exceptions, especially once we get into the uh, larger elements and we get more and more electrons. There are exceptions to the Aufbau principle. For example, if we take a look at chromium and if we take a look at molybdenum and we take a look at gold and silver and copper, we're actually going to see that their electron configurations look a little bit more like this as opposed to what we might predict using the Aufbau principle. And there are going to be exceptions, but for the most part, the Aufbau principle and the method that I showed you is going to allow us to come up with the appropriate electron configuration. I should also add that this is just a method by which these electrons can be assigned to a particular element. It is not the way that the electrons form into the element, it is not the way that the element itself forms, and it's not necessarily there to make sense. What it is, is a method to provide us with a way that is going to give us, most likely, with a few exceptions, the appropriate electron configuration for a particular element. So hopefully, after watching this, and a little bit of practice, you will have a handle on how we come up with something called electron configurations for any particular element on the periodic table. Thanks for watching.